community webinar. I'm Ann Jenks and I'm the co-chair of the Best Practices and Tools Subcommittee. Sponsored. I'm going to do the slide first. Veronica Marzal is the electronic records archivist at the Massachusetts Archives, and she came to the mission from Tufts University. She's co chair of the series STEM committee, and she's on the best practices and tools subcommittee, another one that I can't remember which one it is. <laughs> Eric Myers is the electronic records specialist at the Texas State Library and Archives Commission, and he came here recently from the Kentucky State Archives. And we're glad both of them with us. We um, are able to present this webinar with a grant that we received from the NHPRC. And so as a quick reminder, you need to fill out cost share forms, which Becky will be sending to you in an email after the webinar, because <clears throat> to show cost share for this for this grant. And um, just a reminder that we are going to have a member webinar as well that's going to be on storage and options and cost. Veronica, take it away. Thanks so much, Anne. Um, the other committee that I'm on is the Advocacy Awareness Committee. Um, so just a shout out to that committee on a really successful um, 1010 Electronic Records Day last Friday. Um, I think we had a really great response for that. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and dive right in. Um, a lot of what this presentation will focus on is some of the workflows and tools that um, were developed or used while I was at Tufts. Um, I incorporated over to the Massachusetts Archives. Um, but if anybody is interested in learning more about sort of the Tufts angle of things, I'm more than happy to put people in contact um, with them. So before we dive into sort of the, the meat and potatoes of some workflows and examples, I just wanted to go ahead and set the stage with reviewing a few terms and um, make sure we're all sort of talking about the same thing as we move forward. So in just this session. Um, the SA glossary defines ingest as the purposes related to receiving information from an external source and preparing it for storage. That's a pretty open and vague definition um, that allows for a lot of variation. I've definitely encountered institutions where the term is used very broadly um, and just in terms of describing getting digital materials into their custody, um, while other institutions use it in a much more specific um, mode where they're referring to getting materials specifically into a preservation repository architecture. Um, and once to get into the examples, you'll see sort of those two extremes, um, and I'm trying to make clear which, which one I'm using um, for each of the examples I'll be talking about today. Second, repository. Um, this is another term that gets thrown around an awful lot um, when we're talking about ingest. And I think it has a lot, even more variations of meaning than ingest does um, with environment. You know, the repository could be the place where you store, the repository is the place where the storage of the ingested materials takes place. But our language is pretty inexact. Um, some people, um, that may mean just bringing things into their institution, um, repository in, in that broadest sense. Um, in this, in this case, digital materials may still be on portable media and haven't undergone any particular curation or processing processes. Um, for others, ingest into a repository means getting digital materials onto network storage where they can be monitored and managed. For those who heard Dollar and Lori Ashley speak at the PERTS portal training in D.C., you heard mention of the idea of surrogate repositories. Um, they presented the term as a way to conceptualize storage management environments that electronic records are living in, even prior to transfer of custody to the archives. Um, but I think it's also a very interesting way to think about our own institution's network storage and preservation systems that not meet all the requirements for a digital preservation repository, but the, the best we can do right now and are, are a step toward where we want to be. There is the digital preservation repository, which is often re referred to as a trustworthy digital repository. And again, we run into a bit of a terminology issue 
since the TR is the preservation repository storage environment plus more, plus all those policies and procedures and the planning and the commitments and all the other pieces that go into ISO 1363. Um, those of digital preservation repository environments out there. Um, as I said, for digital preservation repository, you're taking storage and you're adding to it. It's incorporating microservices like file format identification or checksum verification, or it's bundling metadata with the digital file to create a digital object that's matched over time. I'm um, sure you're familiar with this, you know, Fedora, Fedora um, and now we've recently had Archivematica with Dura Cloud coming out. Um, it says, which wasn't something I was familiar with before coming to the parts um, environment um, is digital repository um, by shared by seven or sorry eleven universities in the Florida Public University system and stands for Dark Archives in the Sunshine Sun State, which I thought was kind of awesome. And Rhoda was developed in Spain and stands for Repository of Authentic Digital Objects, which works just by acronym in Spanish though not much in English. Um, and then also Propolon is the company that developed ActiveArc, which is the online software um, in use at the Kansas Enterprise Electronic Preservation System Keep. So just some little Okay, and last thing before I dive into my example, uh, I just wanted to make a, a quick mention of payments, which I think is an often overlooked standard that we have at our disposal. Um, it stands for the Producer Archive Interface Methodology Abstract Standard and the upcoming pay standard, which is Producer Archive Interface Specification. All this is a mouthful, which is why we're all with the acronyms in our profession. Uh, basically, they help you think about what you need to work out with the producer before and during transfer, and it helps you negotiate the transfer agreement. It wasn't something that I was really familiar with before I started working with the DAS subcommittee, um, which is a little embarrassing since uh, the TAPER project I'll be talking about shortly really addresses a lot of the negotiation aspects for tips that uh, Famous talks about. Okay, getting into the examples. So, um, with the Masses Archives, uh, I'll be starting sort of from the point of and just getting the materials into our custody onto a managed network storage environment. Um, the steps that I'll be looking at with that are transfer, stabilization, monitoring. Transfer, um, we're working with two possible options available to agencies, um, either utilizing external hard drives or using a file transfer protocol server. Um, component of transfer that I had not even dreamed would be a possibility, but has met with surprising acceptance, um, at least with one of that we're, we're sort of piloting with, has been the use of Bagger. Um, Bagger is a tool developed by the Library of Congress that lets you gather together files, folders, and, or directories, and you can check on them and create a manifest. Um, the definite advantage to this is that you start your audit trail with the producer or creator rather than waiting until you get the files into your custody. Um, you're really establishing what the file is before it comes to you, um, which is a, a key point where, you know, we could come back to you and say something happened in the transfer. You don't have what I sent you. Um, and I think we'll really be able to um, enhance the authenticity and reliability of our records um, if the things do work out using Baker. Um, a shout out to the North Carolina State Archives. Um, they have a series of videos on YouTube that really walk you through both explaining the purpose and the process of Baker um, and were extremely help, helpful um, in sharing with record creators um, and explaining it to them. The up transfer that I'm like is determining if you're going to impose any sort of file format requirements on your producers, the metadata you're going to request and or require. I personally have always been a proponent of keeping the bar pretty low for record creators. Um, so much taking in anything, any sense. Um, 
and presenting them with a policy around, you know, if you send us a Word doc, we will um, migrate it into a preservation PDFA. You send us some other file format that maybe doesn't have an established preservation um, format, you know, we'll continue to monitor the, monitor the environment, um, maintaining the substream for the original file. Um, let's see. Basically, that's a structure that I took directly from Tuff. I'll be showing you a little bit where you can go and pull that information to you. Um, with this, uh, you know, when it comes, um, you know, I have a basic spreadsheet of information I have taken from the draft guide to metadata that NARA has re recently put out to comment. Um, but I'm not going to stop anything at the door if they're they're willing to send it. Stabilization. Um, I approach the word stabilization in this case as get files to a state where they can sit relatively safely until we can do something more with them, uh, especially in our current situation where we don't yet have a, you know, information repository architecture in place, you know, just getting them, getting them in and getting them stable, um, you know. So we're just bringing in files and they're going into uh, backed up network storage. Um, but even so, I want to make sure that they're checked for viruses, that they have checksums. Um, looking at that, they'll be coming with checksums from Bagger. Um, once I've got them in my custody, we'll be working on migrating to preservation formats, checking uh, those preservation files as well, and documenting everything I've done um, with a README text file. We're in the process of moving to a new archival collection management system, which I'll be utilizing to uh, track a lot of that, um, both administrative and technical metadata going forward. But in terms of the readme file that gives you information on when the transfer occurred, what activities you uh, in with the files, um, can we get you a long way? Uh, just a quick word on checksums. Uh, while at Tufts, I felt really comfortable using just the MD5. Um, even though, you know, there's some issues with being been hacked and such. Now that I'm in more of a, a government environment, I've decided that I run, want to up the city a little bit. So I'm planning to implement the SHA-256 um, and then potentially running the MD5 check as just a, an extra check against it. Um, management and description. Well, I'm just getting um, a record um, that the materials exist into our, our upcoming archival collection management system. Um, and then down the road, we'll be able to flesh the records out a little bit. I did want a little bit in terms of description, um, arrangement and description, that I think when people think of electronic records and, and ingest, they often think you have to describe every single file. Um, we have to go completely throughout we don't have to completely throw out the concept of folders or box level description just because we're working with digital. Don't get me wrong, I'm not saying we don't have to perform preserving activities for every file, but that has to translate into item level cataloging. Um, some things to consider when determining what level to describe your files at, whether, you know, maybe they do deserve file level, or maybe you can take them into a bag out of bagger or, you know, some sort of zip file, um, things to take into account, you know, are the files restricted and you're not going to necessarily be accessing them um, very frequently. You know, is individual access to the file appropriate or needed for reference or other access services? Is they going into a repository with a public interface where having more nice cataloging will really facilitate access or are they going into a dark archive where, you know, they're not there for a while, you can just have your bundle um, bag or your tar file sitting a while and be checking against that, but you don't need to have it down to the individual file. Or is it, you know, an office or collection that's very high profile and likely to get um, a lot of intensive processing for your physical materials, you'd want to, you know, get that over to your electronic materials as well. Okay gotten to that point, um, at least for us in Massachusetts, it's going to be under uh, monitoring for a while until we um, get more access interface in place. 
uh, making sure that the storage media is kept up and through it as it needs to be, you know, getting in there and checking the checksums. I know lots and lots of places that run checksums, but we're that next step of getting there and getting a regular schedule of checking the checksums is it's been a, a hurdle that's pretty hard to, to, to conquer for some places. And then, you know, continuing to review your file formats, making sure that if there's anything else you need to move forward as new preservation environments or preservation formats come into light. Um, going uh, migrating forward additional um, files that way. Okay. Okay. So we'll switch over from the Massachusetts exam, um, the Massachusetts State example, to test collections and archives. Um, here, ingest very specific meant into a preservation repository architecture, and that repository architecture was a uh, Dora-based architecture. Um, again, very simple steps that highlighting except the arrangement and description, which starts out the misspelling, um, is very specifically um, called as a separate as the um, archival collection management systems in a different place, um, certainly in the process of transfer. Um, at Tufts, uh, completed an NHPRC um, funded project to a submission agreement builder tool called Fabit, which thankfully came to be known more simply as our transfer form. Uh, and this transfer form would link into a shared server space that allowed for the transfer of files along with the transfer of the need metadata. Um, here's the, the, the top page for um, paper, and it, it's, you can no, it's uh, dca.lib.tufts.eu slash taper um, for Tufts accessioning program. Um, uh, electronic records is what it originally stood for, though it has been expanded to use this form for all accessions. So it was being captured through this transfer process. Um, roughly, it's the information listed here. Uh, the original intent was the archives and the creating all would work together to create the initial template, um, one for each record group or series, that would serve as the standing submission agreement. And the office used that template. It would produce um, their submission agreement. Um, Actually, it was great. Um, practically, set up most of the forms, and sometimes the offices used them, or sometimes we filled them in for the offices. Um, and what we didn't see was sort of that back and forth negotiation of transfer that we had hoped for. And that is, as it turns out, been a really interesting application of the payment standard of really negotiating how things um, are set up to the archives. Stabilization follows the same steps. Um, since I'd like, to, they've actually started using Bagger as well in house. Um, so when files come in, um, before they have time to do a full arrangement and description of materials, make that determination of what level they're going to catalog to, um, they do go ahead and, and bag everything up, giving them the best to work with and the five the checksum. And description. Primary arrangement and description occurs in CIDR, which is the locally built archival management system. There are many, many, many wonderful things about CIDR, um, but the most relevant one to this presentation is that it is being integrated into the ingest process for their Fedora repository. So, descriptive, administrative, and technical metadata are housed and managed in CIDR, and they're able to do an export, um, which pushes that out. Um, FoxML, um, Fedora object XML, that is bundled with the digital object, and that either goes into the Tufts Digital Library instance of Fedora or to the Dark Archive instance. Um, the main difference being the TD has a publicly seen Hydra head interface. The archive is accessible only through media service through the reading room. Uh, so there's the the monitoring, again, um, it's fairly straightforward since all the metadata is housed inside her. And again, 
checking those checksums um, um, and, and Fedora itself. Um, other um, development around ingest coming to us since I left. They've um, they moved to really embracing Hydra and are developing an administrative interface to help streamline that ingest process, particularly to let other um, elemental library system access it. Um, previously, the repository was strictly used by digital collections and archives. Um, there's you know, other ways at TUS that are interested in, in partnering to make use of that, that, that um, level of preservation storage. So working on um, an interface to help, help all of that. And some, just to, you always want to keep in mind your goals with ingest, that you're trying to get the files into your custody, you're to document everything you do, um, you know, really when looking at our electronic holdings, we want to be able to ensure the authenticity and reliability of those records over time. Um, keeping those files stay safe regardless of the environment you're working in, whether it is just, you know, getting in and trying to get them on supported network storage or actually having a um, repository texture on top of it. Um, and even if you are just working in network storage, you know, building the rest of uh, policies and procedures and workflows around it that can help you um, components of a, a trustworthy digital repository. Um, being a show that you have what you received through your checksums, being able to that no deterioration has occurred through your checksums, and being able to find and access those files um, through your documenting your metadata um, and your migration forward to other files. So with that, I go ahead and turn you down to Mark. Monica, um, as Ann said, I'm Mark Myers. I'm with the Texas State Archives. Up till um, June of this year, I was at the Kentucky State Archives for the last 13 years. So uh, I'm going to be talking mostly about what we did in Kentucky. A few Texas examples uh, as we go in, but I do have a couple of caveats. We're still deeply mired in our procurement process here in Texas, which does limit what we're able to talk about. So with that, uh, anything I say about Preservica is also based on my experience using it in Kentucky. So, and I'm going to go through this really fast because Veronica and Beck only gave me 20 minutes to talk. So with that, um, Following kind of Veronica's outline here uh, with ingest, and I'm adding a piece to the ingest part, which is locating the records. That's what I'm going to kind of talk about uh, the most, is being able to find the records and get them into your archive. And I want to point out the repository in Kentucky structure. Um, I have those things listed, but they're not separate from each other. They're kind of built on top of each other. So they still have the network storage, even though they have DSpace, even though they have Preservica. And part of that is design, because it gives us three copies of records in three different spots, uh, with Preservica giving us the geographically dispersed thing as well. And then we've got those steps, and that's kind of what I'm going to be talking about as we go through this. So Kentucky began actively collecting electronic records in the mid-90s. So how do we find the records? Ourselves. Um, that's pretty much been the bread and butter of the e-archives. Uh, starting in the mid-90s, personnel from KDLA, and by personnel I mean Glenn, um, started you know, agency websites and downloading the records. And that was an activity that was still going on when I was there in May. It's going on now, as far as I know. And um, it started off as a manual process. We've tried to automate that somewhat, and I'll talk about some of the tools that we've done along the way. But as agencies, if you think about websites in the late 90s, early 2000s, they're relatively simple websites. Agencies would put records up, take records down, find records, but then also finding them before they came off the site. Now, agencies are keeping records on their websites for years, uh, even decades. But websites have grown so complex, you've got to find the records on the site. Uh, plus, they may not all be together. So how do you figure out how to get around on the website? And just 
ad hoc uh, cert either. We did have prioritized lists uh, based on the agencies that had been sending us records, uh, based on the been collecting the years in paper. We want to continue to collect those. And even incorporating the retention schedule process. So every quarter, as our records analysts would go out and deal with agencies in career retention schedule. And, and we turned them down. Uh, part of that was because uh, we were doing our own web crawling at that time and we're fairly comfortable with it. The other part was um, we called and we archived the governor's office website, the lieutenant governor's website, and the first lady, but for most agencies, we didn't want to crawl the site. We wanted the records off the site. And uh, although Kentucky did become a full partner in Archivit in 2010, uh, Texas has been there since 2007. And the tool that we were using in Kentucky at the time was this grab -a site tool. And what it did, in addition to pulling down the whole website, is we could point it to a website and have it crawl the site, tell it how deep into the site to go, but only pull back files of a certain type. And so, for example, I could crawl a site, it would crawl the entire site, but only grab all the PDF files or Word docs or whatever. This is something we've been asking Archivit for. for uh, Christine Hanna has referred to us as the most involved non-partner in Archivit up until 2010. Um, we participate in all the meetings and everything. But uh, in the Archivit crawl, while that's an automated crawl, while you can extract metadata from the crawls, it's still all part of the work file. And while you can massage the Archivit site to make the, the files kind of bubble up to the top, it's still part of that work file on the Archivit website. The problems with GrabSite uh, is it's not automated. Uh, it is a manual process. You can save a crawl as a project and then come back and run that project again, and it will remember what it's done and not duplicate itself, but that's about as automatic as it gets. Um, it doesn't capture any metadata about the site either. It's just downloading the files. And uh, as I have on the slide, I'm not sure it's being updated. Uh, the current, when we upgraded to Win7 in Kentucky, it started flaking out. And while it says that it's Win7, Win8 compliant, that version 5 has been out for over a decade now. I don't think the company is really keeping up with the, the tool. And I have Preservica on here because uh, one of the features in the newest version of uh, the Preservica cloud service that came out before I left Kentucky was that you can crawl the web and harvest directly into the Reservica repository, um, but they're using Heratrix, which is the same tool that Archivit uses. So you still have that same issue about the work file. Now Preservica is working on technology that lets you kind of peel the work file apart and get to the juicy bits inside, but packaging it in that format. And I also have on here uh, one of the features I think that Preservica has in their enterprise edition that they're rolling out or roll out in future editions is the ability to crawl FTP sites uh, as well. So that's something to kind of look forward to. But as grab a site kind of died off, we're looking for some other tools. And this is one called Download Them All, which is a browser extension for Firefox. Uh, there's a similar tool called Get Them All, which is an extension for Chrome. They're separate products, but they do the same thing. Um, and was they allow you to get on a URL and then you can grab all, all the files a certain type off of that page. I used this about a year ago to grab 4,000 PDF files off our personnel cabinet's website. Uh, they had all their personnel memos for the last 10 years on their website, and it took about 10 minutes. Um, you can see inside that little circle are the filters, and that's where you can select the file types that you want. It's totally customizable. I created one called Publications that was just PDF files. Uh, if you look at that document files there in the middle, it's PDF, PDF, Word Duck. Uh, so they're really, it is really customizable. You can also rename the files as you download them. Um, that wasn't a big issue for us in Kentucky, uh, but I do know that there are other states that deal with naming conventions. And then again, the issues here are it is still a manual process. It's not automated. Uh, it only works on a single page. It doesn't crawl the site. Having any metadata, it's just downloading the files. That's it. A similar tool that I was using uh, is this YTD video downloader, and 
Uh, this is an application. The other uh, piece of screen was a browser extension, so you can run it directly out of your web browser. This is a separate app, and what it does is you type in the URL, and it finds all the media files on a site, and you can download those. Uh, it will also let you convert a file, so you can say download a flash file, and then convert to MPEG-4 as a more stable uh, you could also download, say, a video file and turn it into an MP3 if you just want the audio track, for example. It allows for in and stopping, so if it gets interrupted, it'll pick back up where it stopped off. There is a free version. There's a pro version, which is an annual subscription. I think it costs about 30 bucks a year. And in the pro version, you can do that conversion on the fly. With the free version, you have to download the files and then convert them as a two-step uh, process. But it has the same limitations uh, download the mall tool had. It's not automated. It is just a single page, and it doesn't collect any metadata. And I have legality on here because while it's not illegal, I'm not supposed to be able to download YouTube files. That's the point of YouTube. That said, there are hundreds of video downloaders out there. So this tool could go away if Google, who owns YouTube, really pushes it. But there are tools out there to use. If you want to get further down the road of legality, ask me about the DRM removal tools that I have. Um, agents started using websites and using more and more um, things off of their websites. They started using social media files as well. So right about the time we get, wrap our hands around the website, we start having to worry about things like Flickr and YouTube. And then once we get Flickr and YouTube under control, if anybody has done that, uh, you start getting Instagram and Pinterest and Facebook book and so how do you find these files? This brings us to method number two, which is talk to the agency. I mean, this is probably the most important site I have up here. You've got to involve the agencies on how you do this, and you've got to get them involved in the process. Uh, when I started doing presentations in 05, 06 about our e-records program, agencies, um, well, you know, agencies to send you electronic records, and I would be like, well, we ask for them. But, uh, when they send us paper publications, we call them up and say, hey, do you have this in PDF for us? Uh, our records office, our records analysts, as they would go out and talk to agencies and ask for annual reports and minutes and so forth, they would start asking for them in electronic format. Um, so get them involved in the process. Coordinate the harvesting. I had agencies that would send me uh, an email and say, hey, we just posted a new file to our website. Here's the link. Uh, I even had agencies that informed me when they were going to redesign their website. And that all comes from just developing a relationship with the agency and talking to them. Um, basically, our big thing was trying to get agencies to tell us when to take records off the site. That was the big point. But even if they're sending you transfers, you still need to coordinate that transfer. How are they going to get it to you? What media do they use? What tools should they use? Um, and I'll talk about that here in just a second. But first, I want to talk about method number three which make for you or get the agencies to do it for you if you want to be polite. Um, this is why we looked at DSpace. One of the reasons we looked at DSpace was because DSpace has the ability to allow uh, agencies to deposit directly into space. And one of our goals was to get records officers to upload their own files. And this is really good for these kind of um, documents like minutes or pubs or annual reports, the kind of things they would send via email. Um, they could fill out a template. Uh, if it was pre-set information, if it was the same information over and over again, we could have that template already pre-filled. All they had to do was add a title, a date, a file. Uh, the archivist can approve, reject, and edit those files. And um, this was something that we never quite got off the ground, largely because every time we got ready to roll it out, something would happen and push to the back burner. So we never really promoted it that well. When I left KDLA in May, we had one records officer that was actively using it. Uh, we had some other records officers that had expressed interest in it, and I even developed some instructions on how to do that. But we never quite pushed it out there. Um, so that said, you could probably do this in Preservica too. If you set an agency up as a user and give them access, I don't know if they have the approve, reject, and edit steps like DSpace does, but that's something that could be kind of modified relatively uh, quickly and easily. So that's something to think about as well. So agencies are sending you stuff. You have instructions. And in, in our world, that means policies and procedures. 
So one of the things that we did very early on is we mod in Kentucky is we modified our administrative regulation for state pubs from saying three copies in paper to three copies in paper or one electronically. I am or one copy electronically because agencies started sending me three copies electronically. Um, what I usually got more often was we'd get it in paper and electronic until we told them to stop because they'd add us to their email mailings but not take us off the paper mailing list. But we even got to the point where we told agencies to stop sending us paper for certain publications and so forth. The other thing that we did with our AR was we mandated PDF as the format. And I had some hesitancy about put in the AR because if we change that, we have change the AR. But PDF was a state standard for published material on the internet. So you're able to incorporate that into the regulation. The thing we did was uh, modify our transfer guidelines. So it was all about the paper process. We added the electronic process to that. And as I said, it's very similar. You know, you still have to tell agencies how to package the files. What to put in discrete folders. Make sure you have the right things in the right folders. Make sure they're clearly labeled. What media you're going to use. What format you want. So this link that's on this slide is a link to the, the transfer guidance document itself. This is our file formats guideline, and I put this out here because everybody and their cousin has this now. NAR has one, LC has one. We ripped this off of the universities before everybody else did, so it, we've had it file. And this is our file format guidelines, and I said desired formats because, like Veronica said, we're going to take what the agency sends us. But the idea was to try to get this out there um, and give this some guidance on what we were going to do. So the high confidence column are those file formats that we're going to preserve. That's what we're going to migrate to. That's what we're going to normalize to. Those are the open, sustainable formats. I don't want technology neutral because no such creature exists. All formats require technology. These are the sustainable formats. These are the ones we're going to preserve. The medium are the ones agencies may be using and that will bring those in and then we'll, we'll nice to something else. The big key was to try to get agencies away from the low confidence level. And those are the proprietary formats, the ones that have compression, that have digital rights management, you know, all the things that we don't want in a file. So there's a link to that on the website as well. And then you stuff. You still have to tell them how. And this again gets back to the communication and the instructions. How are you going to receive the material? Email is good for single file transfers, for small files. Most email systems are limited by file size, so you can't send really big stuff. Uh, but you'll need to give them instructions. I had an agency that was sending me uh, minutes as the body of the email. And I told them to stop because that made the email then a permanent record. I wanted them as an attachment, so then the email was an envelope at a point that I could get away, do away with and keep the file. Um, so tell people how to do that. On media, hopefully you're not getting floppy disks that much anymore, but you know, what media can you accept? What are you not going to accept? Uh, CDs and DVDs are starting to kind of fall by the wayside in some ways. Old CDs can be problematic. Um, flash drives are tend to be relatively standard, but you can get those like SD cards and they're all over the place. Even hard drives. Uh, here in Texas, we had a digitization project where we digitized a bunch of cassette tapes. And the vendor that was doing the project for us, the first hard drive they sent us was formatted for Mac rather than CD. So our wind environment had issues with it. So you need to tell people on what you're doing. Uh, FTP sites are good for large files, but you still need instructions on how to navigate the site, where the files are. Do you have access to the site? Uh, you may be able to navigate the site, but you may need separate access to actually download something. So negotiate that as well. The um, direct deposit, I mentioned DSpace. One of the other things that we did with our GIS uh, folks is we gave them direct access to our network. So we were doing quarterly snapshots of the state's geodatabase, and they could dump it directly into our network. Uh, we actually had an agency that did the opposite with us. They gave us access to their network because they had a cache of high-resolution photographs, and we were able to go in and pull those out as we uh, could get to them. So all that's done by talking to the agency. 
This is a copy of uh, Preservica SIP Creator. This is basically how you get files into Preservica, whether it's the Enterprise Edition or the Cloud Edition. And what this does is it helps you arrange the, the package. So at the top, you can point this to a folder that has multiple files in it and then decide, do you want to keep that as one unit? Do you want to split it apart? Uh, you know, how you want to organize those things. You can put it into a collection. This is the bottom half of that screen, and then you can attach metadata to that. And so you can attach this to, say, a catalog record. You can, if you have metadata in an XML format at the bottom where it says generic metadata, you can attach those files directly to the submission. So that being part of the submission. Uh, you've got the fixity checks uh, as well for uploading it into the cloud system. Files on our server. This is our network storage, and you have it's organized by agency and then by accession. So you can see the folder there that is the accession and all the items within it. So if we were to load that into Preservica, for example, we could choose to keep all of those individual items as individual items or keep it all together as one package uh, based on that. But uh, it has our accession number attached to it so we can identify when those records came in. This is our accession form. You got to have metadata about everything. This is the, the form that we use to collect that and dump it into our access database. This is telling you what's on that form. So I kind of put both up here because the screenshot may not be totally clear. But this is the information that we're collecting about the transfer. And um, it's similar to what Veronica showed you with what they were doing in Tufts. This isn't kind of a fancy form. Um, but this is what we're entering into our database. Some of the issues with that, it's not automated, it's manual. We have to enter this in. If agencies uh, fill out the form, uh, it's done in paper. They send to us, we have to enter it back into the database. It doesn't extract anything from the files. All it's doing is recording what came in. Um, so this is, again, it, it's a model of our paper system. So we modified this to deal with electronic records, which has its good points and its bad points uh, for that. But uh, this tracks the accession information. E space gets greater arrangement and description. So this is still the delay uh, mechanism. You can search for files, but then you can also see the structure that we have here. They're grouped by basically record series when the cabinet and then agencies. And this is the DSpace form. So the top left is basically the simple item view that someone would see if they clicked on a record in DSpace. The bottom right would be what they get if they click on that show full item record. And what I want to show here is what's inside that circle. Load this slide up to where you can see it. Is um, our action number. So it modified the DC identifier other field in DSpace to accommodate the exception number. This connects it to our accession metadata. So this is a way of connecting that metadata together. With Perica, we can suck that accession metadata as an XML file up into the package cell. So again, it's making these systems talk to each other and be able to share that data. Uh, Preservica does all the preservation actions, and I'm not going to go through that because I've done this many times for people. Uh, but basically, like Veronica does the virus scan and care and all that. So to kind of summarize, um, you need to find the records, you need to bring them into your control, and you need to apply the appropriate metadata. So that's as simple as it, as it gets. And then you do the arrangement and description. So some other key points, as I said, communication is the key be able to talk to the agency. You have to negotiate with them and get them involved in the process. Help them figure out where the, help them help you figure out where the records are and how to get them into the archive. And then automate this as much as you can. Um, there are some things you may not be able to automate. There are things that you probably shouldn't automate, but try to automate what you can. Metadata capture is one, whether it's harvesting uh, or, or extracting from files uh, or, or if you have to enter it in by hand, do it once and push it out to other systems. And this is why it's important to make sure that systems can talk to each other. And the last thing is this idea of keeping it simple. 
uh, looked at Bagger when uh, we were coming out of the GeoMap project and kind of decided that it was too much for state agencies. Uh, you don't you want to limit the hoops that they have to jump through to send you stuff or they're not going to do it. But at the same time, I recognize that you do need to have ways of securing the transmission. So when you move records around, that's where you can introduce errors. So you do need ways of being able to say, yes, this is what was sent, and I received what you sent me. So I think Bagger is probably as good a tool as any um, to be able to do that and uh, make sure the objects haven't uh, changed in transit. So I believe I'm under 20 minutes. Yay. Um, I'm died. I don't know who I turn it back over to for questions. Okay. If you have any questions, you can just speak them out or put them in the chat. To verbally ask your question, raise your hand and we can unmute you. Waiting for questions. Um, remember another webinar coming up on November fifth. That's going to be about storage. Entered a question into the Q and A. I can for Kentucky. I mean. Do anything with premise metadata uh, basically until we got to uh, Preservica. So that's one of the things that Preservica does is it, uh, as it characterizes the file and validates the format, it will record a lot of that premise metadata. I think DSpace does capture some of that, but not nearly. It, it doesn't actually validate formats. It basically knows it. If you say it's a PDF file, it knows it knows what a PDF file is. But it doesn't really validate any. So, um, to the. I add to that um, that. So, you know, um, when Premise first came up, we looked at it, well, at Tufts. Um, and we're really dealing with that a lot of the activities that we wanted to, to really track were those sort of pre ingest. Um, a lot of things about premise are very based on the, the more automated tasks that occur once you've actually got it into a repository system. You know, when the, the you know, creating the trail sort of in the repository. Um, so we're really struggling with trying to implement premise when what we really wanted to track was sort of that pre engine um, that we call stabilization. Um, what we ended up doing is in building CIDR, the archival collection management system, we really built in a lot of that tracking into there. Um, prior to having CIDR, we were using it um, a lot in the README file where we were documenting, you know, who ran this activity and sort of creating the the structure of premise without sort of the XML tags around it, um, that's really much of a tool <laughs> um, for creating it other than I think now that site in place at Tufts, they can sort of exit that out as part of their FoxML and have that, that processed information wrapped up with the object as it goes into Fedora. Um, but I don't know of anything that sort of wraps up the the activities um, and agents once it's actually in the repository itself and adds it to the to the object. Questions and uh, Karen Smith said that uh, WebWacker and WebWacker is a sister product to Gravisite. And uh, WebWacker wasn't as functional. Uh, we used Gravisite. Gravisite was for bigger 
So I don't know if those, again, are still there. That site is still active. You can still go to Gravisite site and download the product. And the last time I used it, that tool for grabbing files off the site still worked fairly well. It was the web archiving part that was starting to get really, really flaky. So uh, somebody else asked about what harvesting programs do you recommend. Uh, when it comes to archive websites, I don't think you can bark of it. Uh, quite frankly. Now, like I said, if you want files off the site, um, I'm not sure. Uh, I know there are some command line tools like uh, say HT Track and others, but uh, that's why we were starting to look at these individual tools. Um, Matt, um, there's another question from Kari um, about successful ways that you've tried for transferring records. Um, I've definitely had situations where we had, um, you know, the, it was a networked environment. You put up a password protected share on the environment. You know, the um, NC or office would upload files to there. You'd go um, in and bring them locally. Um, also, something like a, a Dropbox or um, a top that was a Zytho specifically. Um, or are probably going to be using external hard drives for I mean transfer we're going to be having here in Massachusetts. So we use to virtually everything I talked about. Um, email was very common. Uh, CDs, we, we would get things for on CD. Um, this goes back to the instruction part because what's cool is when you get a CD in the mail and you don't know what it is and you don't know what's on it. Um, you can identify sometimes the agency because it's on the envelope, but it is. But, um, and we even had an external hard drive, for example, that we would give an agency and let them put records on it and then bring it back. But we had agencies that provide their own as well. FT uh, was another one. Our state pushed SFTP, which secure our FTPS, which is the secure FTP, but same idea. Yeah. And then, then, Kate, I think mostly for you, Mark, about since you decided that beggar was too much of an onus, um, did you end up with something to sort of take the authenticity of the transfer? And uh, Glenn, add to this if he wishes, but no, not really. Uh, most, since most of what we were getting was actually done by us. You know, it's going. Even if we talked to an agency and negotiated with them, we went to their website and pulled it down. Uh, we didn't really do a lot uh, with the uh, checksums or things like that. Um, because we had worked with our GIS folks through the GeoMap project, they were probably a little bit more secure in transferring their files. But again, because they were putting them directly on our network, uh, they were handling them and they were dealing with them. So we didn't really worry as much about uh, something happening in transit because they could set them up and then test to make sure that they were still uh, good. Um, I don't know if we had, I'm sure we had some files that we got with checksums attached to them, but not on a regular basis. I was really surprised that the agency that I've been working with um, for sort of Massachusetts' first big transfer was very open to to, they, they really want to make sure that they can prove authenticity down the road. Um, so they were really open to the idea of using Bagger. They're definitely, now that they have um, are getting into it more, they're a little, little bit overwhelmed. But I think definitely the possibility of using Bagger on an external hard drive and sort of have Bagger Day where we take the, the hard drive around and uh, grab files that they've sort of pre-selected or have have ID and set to go for transfer um, has some really good potential to to get away from some of that onus of every person in that office needing to go through and you know download Bagger and that's not even the hard part it's really it's the configuring job that trickle up. And here in Texas, and I'm kind of looking at this question that brought about what important to disk images have. Um, here in Texas, we're looking at, at negotiating directly with agency because Texas hasn't been taking in electronic records, so they're going to start that. And the first 
just that we're going to get is about 10 terabytes of data. And uh, so we, we have been in negotiations over the last year or so with agencies over that. And you know, they've talked about checksums and that sort of thing. So I know the, the people here before I got here have been promoting that idea. So that's something that we're working on now, how we're going to facilitate those transfers. And uh, from a disk image standpoint, again, I have recently installed the BitCurate set uh, here in Texas uh, so we can kind of play with it and see how it can benefit us here. Um, hired a, a new digital asset coordinator who's looking at all of our images, and he's been going through hard drives, for example, uh, all the portable hard drives that we have around here. And we've talked about that this morning, actually, of possibly being able to image those things and be able to look at them and see what's on there. So we're still kind of playing with that, but we haven't really had a call for uh, on any wide scale. My experience with them has been mostly that it can really sort of save you a step if you've got a collection of, of files that you are going to have, you have determined you're going to catalog at the aggregate level, that you don't, you know, you got in, say, a CD from an office, you're, you could go ahead, you have to pull everything off of it to create your preservation, um, preservation file for those and, and the accompanying metadata for the preservation aspect of it, but your this image can serve really as your bundled aggregate um, documenting your transfer. So rather than going and having everything pulled in and having to, you know, put back together in a tar file or back together in a bag through bag, or you have your your diskage as your you know authenticated saw of what was transferred. Um, so I think it it gets steps also in terms of you know having to repackage things back up if you are cataloging at the aggregate level. The other idea of the disk image too is if you get uh, on a media that you want to investigate what it is without affecting the files on the media. Um, so again, we we haven't really run into that too much in Kentucky where we've gotten old media. Uh, we've gotten old files but they've been given to us by the agency. So we haven't had to like take the, the floppy drive and try to scan it or something like that. Uh, so, so nice. thing you wanted to add? Yeah, as I, I wrote in there, can you hear me? Yes, we hear you. Um, then in Kentucky, we used uh, bag it, which is what we called it at the time. Uh, and I assume that's the same as what you're talking about a bagger. The LC project um, with a set of local records where we had a memorandum of agreement that we wanted to verify exactly what it was they were giving us, and they were willing. They were technical enough that that was hard to use. So um, it's a, a very specific set of circumstances when when you need to have the manifest and the lead transfer. Um, Matt Cording, which we got. A good tool. I mean, I, I do. I think it's it's useful. Um, like I said, we just made kind of a, a on the fly decision, and we're certainly considering it here in Texas now. So. Yeah. And now for everybody that. Um, Sorry, added a little bit more about Bit Curator in the in response to Brian's question. Um, they need a disk that makes sense. So for so for record creating computer, not just other media, um, other the digital forensics and disk imaging is all right to do, but might not be necessary. So it goes in the recording. She answered the question that Stephanie put in. What harvesting program do you recommend at this time? Yes, said, like I said, um, if you're talking about having a website, and, and if you're using ARC, I still think it's it's probably the best. Um, 
to out there. HT track is another one that's really kind of powerful, but if I'm not mistaken, that's a command line tool. So you've got to be not the command line in order to use it. Um, and those are that I'm really of. Thanks, everybody. Um, Becky, I think, is going to send out a situation to everybody after the session. And remember, talk, share, sheet. And on the screen, you'll see the next webinar. Thanks, Monica and Mark. And have a great day.